Well, good day, Max here again. Welcome back to the shop. So this week we're going to have a big push on to knock off the cast iron component of the lap. I think mean, uh, we've been dragging our feet. Well, not really, but it seems it feels to me like we have. So we'll get a big push on. We'll get that knocked out so we can get our tube lapped out and our grinding fixture back in action. So here we go. That's just a moderate speed that, 300 RPM and a slow feed rate so it stops all the, all the rubbish flying out everywhere, everything's kept contained. So it may take a tad longer in time wise turning it but what, what I lose here I save on the clean up. So we'll get set up now and do the, we'll get it swapped over machine this part in the fore jaw then we'll get the tapered bore done now the reason why I'm using the fore jaw is because it's a bit of cast iron bar and it's uh, not really a recommended practice to hold rough old stuff in a three jaw especially if you've got a good three jaw uh, anyway we'll move on Okay, now we're ready to bore out the tapered bore in the lapping tool. So that will be cut to a 1 16th per inch taper. So we'll swing the compound slide around to achieve that value. Now, we'll be using the dial indicator to set the compound angle. One thing is really critical is your indicator is on center height. So we've just used a tailstock center here to set it up. So We'll get the indicator now set up on the workpiece and then we'll mark off the sixteenth per inch taper we have to cut. Okay, it's time to swivel our compound rest around so we can cut this taper. So our shaft that we have to match has a it's a one sixteenth taper per foot on our shaft. So we need to know how far to swivel the compound, so we need some some decimal readings. So the 1 16th taper per foot works out to a total included angle of 18 degrees and because we're cutting a taper and a lathe we're working between our tapered angle we want to cut and the center line of the lathe so the value gets halved so it brings it down to nine minutes. Now the total taper per inch that's the included angle it's five and two tenths, so we want to halve that to, well is it, here we are, look, there's a mistake in this book, that should have an extra zero there, so that should read um, 0 0.0026041, not what it's reading there, because this value is half of this value. So, because we're cutting um, taper per inch and we're going to measure on our job over a three inch length we take this taper per inch reading here which I have here on the calculator so we multiply that by three and that gives us seven and eight tenths so our dial indicator that we have set up on the compound must move seven and eight tenths over a three inch distance to be able to cut the one sixteenth per foot taper. Just um, just a thing to be aware of. Um, in these books, you know, they're not always mistake free, as we've just found there. If you're not sure, quite often there's other relative tables that. Um, Especially in tapers, there's lots of information. Here's another one here. Okay, taper in certain lengths when the taper per foot is, not, is given. So we, we know our taper per foot. 
which is 1 16th per foot and we're measuring over a 3 inch length which in this column so that gives us 0 0.0156 so if we halve that so we go 0 0.0156 divided by 2 gives us our 7 and 8 tenths taper so it's just something to be wary of so we'll swing over to the lathe and I'll show you how we can get this taper exact on the compound okay this is the best method that I know of to accurately set a compound it's quite simple straight with a dial indicator there's lots of other methods but this is to me this is the easiest for a quick setup so we zero our dial indicator on our part making sure we have enough compound travel to move the three inch length that we're going to measure across we did work out our measurements we're all given from taper per foot and then that's converted down to taper per inch and so on and so on so what I'll do is I'll put a zero out now this is a metric dial on here so we zero on here we'll put two sharpie markers on the compound then I'll get a square engineer square and just very lightly draw a line down there then I'll advance the compound 76.2 millimeters which is three inches and as this line comes up here I can come up to my dial on the compound to 76.2 okay so then we come across to our dial indicator and we are seven it's close, pretty close, seven and eight tenths. So it's pretty hard to chase that last tenth. I don't think I can get a, a better shot of that. Camera. Oh, here we are, I might get something here, move the light away. No, okay, you'll just have to trust me. That's pretty close to seven and eight tenths. So, we can get a tool set up now and take a couple of trial cuts but without a um, DRO um, this is just the old style method of doing it which is um, just as accurate as any DRO if you're careful Okay, we'll have to take this taper in two bites due to the uh, pipe being longer than the travel on the compound. So that was only a cut without cut then. I did have a trial fit just before. It actually quite surprised me how little I had to take out for the amount the shaft went in being such a small taper. So I'll just get this other little bit out the back and take another cut. Okay, so we'll just give the bore a bit of a quick polish out before we have a test fit. So just a bit of emery paper on a half round file.
give that a good blow out and we'll give it a test fit. Okay, as the rain comes down. <laughs> okay, we'll test our taper. Little Sharpie marker. Pop her in. I'll try that in two different spots. She's tight. Well, I'm quite happy with the amount of contact we're getting off that. See what's transferred through into the inside. I'm sure, you probably won't be able to pick that up. Oh, there's a There it is. A bit hard to see. It's transferred most of the way down, so bear in mind we do have a relief section at the back here where it won't contact, so I'm happy with that. Right, that's really good. Nice fit. Okay, so what we have to do now is put our radial, well, machinist to a finished diameter, inch and seven eight, and then we put radial grooves in, very shallow grooves in, probably five eighths of an inch or half inch apart, and longitudinal grooves, axial grooves down to make square patterns. That's for the lapping compound to rest in. And then we have to put a slot, machine a slot down it so the thing can expand. And then I think we're going to drill a few holes around the, down the length of it and slot it on the inside so the thing can expand. So we'll move on with that. Okay, well we were going to finish the OD of this first, but I've decided against that. I'll do that last. What I'm doing now, I've got to set we will set this up in the mill so we can drill our holes. So I've got a long drill bit, so we've got to drill a hole all the way, several holes around the face there, but all the way through the part. Um, so I'm going to mount this little chuck in the mill to drill it. So all I'm doing now is squaring the part up to the chuck, then we'll mount the chuck into the rotary table, and then we'll clock the whole assembly up but uh, if I don't square the part up in the chuck here when I'm in the rotary table I can't guarantee the parts going to be um, parallel with the spindle of the machine so because this chuck will grip it you know either or, or so it's it's easier to just clock it up in here now I can't check it like that and then move the indicator down here and, and rotate it and check it there because there's run out between this chuck and this chuck and these jaws and this part. So all I'm doing is just picking one point, any point, zero the indicator, run it down lengthwise, come back and I've just tapped it with a hammer just to true the part up that way. We're spot on there. So we come around 90 degrees, we do the same thing, we get a reading, come back, make sure we're on the same reading, and if we're not, we've just tapped it with a hammer, 
So we've guaranteed now our part is perpendicular to the face of the chuck. It's going to be running out axially, but that doesn't matter because we can take care of that once we are in the rotary table. So that was our main concern, to get this perpen our job perpendicular with the chuck. So we've achieved that. So we'll take the whole assembly out now. Take this over to the rotary table and then we can indicate it properly. Okay, well the plan with this was to drill it using the either the rotary table or the indexing head and uh, just index around and drill our holes, but this little machine here doesn't have enough height to accommodate that, so all we can do is mount it in a chuck down here. Now I did put this back in the lathe and I, and I used a tool and described it a pitch circle diameter line around the end. It's just a just a circle around the end there. And I'll divide that up into either six or eight, probably go eight. Eight divisions. And we'll drill a hole through. So we'll get out the old center square. Randy Richard Scriber. They don't have to be exactly precise, so Could set it, step it out with a set of dividers if I wanted to be a bit closer. No, this is fine. Okay, so we have our eight holes equally marked out. So we'll start drilling. Well, okay, we'll bring you in for our last hole. And we just eyeball it up on our scribe lines. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Now, we are using a, it's a six millimeter um, hole that we're doing all the way through. So we're doing the first half of the hole with a standard 6mm drill bit just to save the life and wear and tear on the long series drill because we need that in good condition for the remaining half of the hole. And we're using a very light, very light feed pressure down so we don't want the drill to start wandering and drill a hole through the side of the part. a lot of pecking when we're drilling like this just to make sure we don't get any chips hung up in the um, drill and so everything clears properly. So now we'll get our long series drill in 
Now we have to use the long series drill and the collet chuck because of our height restrictions. So we'll pop the drill chuck out and swap over, put the collet chuck in. We do have to put the drill in the collet chuck first. Same thing again with our height restrictions. And then put our drawbar in so it doesn't, the whole show doesn't fall out. Okay, so we'll be doing a lot of pecking and very light feed pressure as we mentioned before. So. Okay, well we'll get a countersink set up and we'll countersink the holes just to deburr them top and bottom and then we'll uh, pop it back in the lathe, I think, well we might do, I don't know, we'll have a think about it because we have some internal slots to do too so. Okay, we've successfully drilled our 6mm holes through our part, the spacing is reasonable. Now the length we were drilling was 5 inches, and remember how I was talking about drills wandering if you got too much pressure? Well we didn't have too much pressure. What we did have, we had a, a weird scenario, so I'll try and explain what's sort of happened before I cut, well I did, I cut that off, so. So what's happened? When we've drilled our holes, all the holes have come through further towards the OD of the part than what we had on our starting side. Which is a bit of a strange scenario because, I mean, I could expect that to happen if we were in an indexing head and we were drilling at, a, the head, or at an angle. And of course when you rotate around you're going to get the same result for everyone. But we were drilling, we were moving the part around the drill. So if the head of the mill was on an angle, yeah, these holes would have broken through closer to the centre and these holes would have broken through closer to the outside. But where, when you look at the holes where they did break through, it's consistently well except for, for that one and that one and that one there's three of them consistently or oh, and that one four of them have gone to the outside so that's a bit of a mystery I'll have to scratch my head over that so what that has done because on our lap design we want to cut some slots through to the inside to enable the lap to expand. Now because we're so close to the outside, if I cut now our slots to the inside, we've taken all the strength out of the lap, the, the thing is likely to just snap in half. So we have to have a bit of a design plan, design change. So what I intend to do now is cut this in half that way we'll have the good section of holes, we've still got plenty of pudding around the outside and we'll use this end, I spoke about a pilot earlier on in the series I was hoping not to have to use one but I'm going to have to now because we're going to cut this in half so what the pilot will do
in our part that we have to lap uh, from about here to here on the inside it's stepped up in diameter so we're you might see it we're only lapping oh, probably an inch and a half in each either end and then the, the center is relieved so what I was afraid might happen if our lap um, came out or like if it wasn't engaged in the two lapping areas to be lapped at the same time we would get a bell mouth effect so when we cut this lap here in half we're only going to be lapping one area at a time so the other half will be acting as a pilot to hold the part straight so we we don't have a bell mouthing problem so we can rescue the situation so we'll get this in the lathe and get it parted off well before we part it off we'll take this to the to the uh, finished diameter that we need to lap to inch and seven eight and then we'll part this in half and then um, you see it goes that way because we have chopped a, a fair bit off it, it's, it's come right up on our taper now. But luckily we had a fair bit of relief cut inside our, our nut. So when our nut goes on, trouble with these fine threads, they take forever to wind. We're still coming up against our, our lap, so I can, the nut will still push on the lap to expand the lap. So, failing that, we could have put a spacer in between, so that's no biggie. So We'll get this set up now, and we'll, we'll turn our OD, chop it in half. Okay, let's get our lap shortened up so we can sort of salvage the situation. Okay, that's looking good. At least we've got a bit of pudding between the edge of the hole and the edge of the lap now, so that's good. It also has an added advantage. I have less distance to slot, so <laughs> that's worked out well. We'll face that off and deburr it. Okay, so we have our lap set back up on the arbor back in the lathe. So we're going to cut some radial grooves around the lap. We're not worried about this section because they're the two spaces. So it's just this part here. This just we'll do the radial grooves, then we'll do the longitudinal grooves. So this gives an area for the lapping paste to sit in. So I'm only going to do them 10 millimeters apart, and they're only very shallow grooves. So. <coughs> Okay, so that's all our rings cut in, so we'll set our tool up now to run longitudinally and we'll cut these in by hand. Okay, that's so what we do, we start off in our very end radial groove and we move our tool into the required depth and then by hand we'll just drive the line across.
It's a matter of getting it lined up. We're going out to our required depth. We drive across, pull the tool out. Come round to the next one. Repeat the process. Okay, that's all our axial and radial lines done for the lapping compound to sit into in our lap. So now we'll set up to slot these holes. That will allow the lap to flex in and out for our adjustment. Some burrs off. 